As I mentioned, even before Newton's time, uh, Johannes Kepler uh, was studying the orbits and motions of the planets, and up until Newton, he was able to provide the most comprehensive description of uh, orbital paths. Now, one of the things we have the benefit of hindsight is we can take Newton's laws and use them to explain Kepler's laws. But before we do that, we need to know what Kepler's laws were. Um, he originally formulated this for the planets in our solar system, but they apply for any closed orbit anywhere in, in the universe as far as we can tell. So these are, are highly applicable. Now Kepler's first law is that each planet moves in an elliptical orbit with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. Up until Kepler, um, all orbits were assumed to be perfect circles, and this is something that was inherited from the Greeks who believed uh, in the sort of beauty and symmetry of, of spheres and circles and avoided to a great degree um, this, this assumption. But, but Kepler finally made it and was actually able uh, to prove it out with data taken from precise measurements over a long period of time of the positions of the planets. Um, for those who are not familiar with an ellipse, one way to make an ellipse is to take a loop of string and you have two points that you uh, stick into like a, a, a cork board and you put the string around it and you take a pencil and you draw it around. And what's going on here is that at any point along the ellipse, your distance from one of those uh, two um, pins, uh, in other words, the two focal points as they're called, uh, your distance from the one plus your distance from the other stays constant. Um, so PF plus PF prime equals constant. As you move those focal points closer and closer together, uh, eventually you'll converge to a circle, which is where both focal points occupy the same point at the center of the circle. And then PF plus PF prime uh, is just the distance from that single point to the edge. And what you're saying is your distance from the edge, uh, from the center, is equal everywhere. So a circle is a special case of an ellipse. Now, uh, let's just go over some terminology for ellipses. Uh, an ellipse has a semi-major axis, which is the furthest point along the ellipse from the direct center of the ellipse. A semi-minor axis, B, which is the closest, a point of closest approach to the center of the ellipse. And there's a parameter called the eccentricity, which is the distance of the focal point from the center. Um, and you can define the semi-minor axis in terms of the semi-major axis. B equals A times the square root of 1 minus E squared. Now, for a circular orbit, this is the case where E equals 0. When E equals 0, A equals B, which equals R. It's the radius. Um, and that's in uh, the case where both of the focal points are collapsed onto the center of the ellipse. The other extreme, of course, is where eccentricity is approaching 1, and that's where this sort of elliptical oval shape gets really, 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 really increasingly narrow on one direction and increasingly far out in the other direction. Um, and so those are the two extremes. Eccentricity varies between 0 and 1. Kepler's second law is the equal areas law, and it says that a line from the sun to a given planet will sweep out an equal area in equal times. So in the diagram that we have uh, drawn on the right here, we have a planet with a fairly elliptical orbit or a fairly oblique elliptical orbit with a high enough eccentricity that you can see it. In truth, most of the planet's orbits in our solar system um, are indeed elliptical, uh, but, but it's a very uh, low eccentricity uh, that to the eye almost looks circular. It's not quite. You can kind of make it out if you squint at it. But this is a slightly extreme case. And what we see is that the planet um, sweeps across a larger distance when it's closer to the sun and a smaller distance over the same amount of time when it's further from the sun. But if you take the area of these two triangles, well, they're not exactly triangles, these, these two pizza wedges, that area is equal. So it will go um, faster with, at a shorter distance. So if we think of this distance as kind of the base of the triangle, um, the height, uh, when the height is smaller, the base is wider. And when the height is longer, the base is smaller in a way that preserves the area. So that the common thing that we see is that the area swept out by that planet uh, is, is equal for any um, delta t 
uh, around that orbit. So um, wherever it is in the orbit, if I measure over the same delta t, it's going to sweep out the same area. And the consequence of that is in an, in an elliptical orbit, the object is going to have a faster speed when it's closer and a slower speed when it's further. Um, and we're going to see that this is actually a consequence of the conservation of angular momentum, which is pretty cool. Um, so let's, let's see that. If we write delta area over delta t, well, if we make these wedges small enough, if we make delta t small enough, we can indeed make this kind of triangular approximation. Um, and we get that 1 half r um, times r delta theta over delta t, okay? And uh, this r delta theta here is the arc length, which is the base of our triangle. And r is the height of our triangle. So this is um, height times base, 1 half height times base. This term here is our triangular area, um, all of that over delta t. And uh, we can write this as being um, v perpendicular, the velocity in the direction that is perpendicular to the radius, or the tangential velocity. Why? This is the angular speed, and r times the angular speed gives us the tangential speed. So this whole term here is equal to v perpendicular. And so we have 1 half rv perpendicular. Now, if we do an algebraic trick of multiplying this by m and also dividing it by m, we can rewrite this as mrv perpendicular divided by 2m, which equals uh, the angular momentum, because mrv perp is the angular momentum, divided by 2m. Now, that, uh, that 2m is a constant. The mass of the planet or object that's orbiting isn't changing. And so this whole term has to be a constant precisely because um, in the absence of a torque, the angular momentum is conserved. And so L is a constant. And if L is a constant and m is a constant, then delta A delta T has to be a constant. So Kepler's law, as it turns out, is a consequence of conservation of angular momentum. And again, this is the genius of Newton. He was able to derive that the behavior of planets in the heavens is following the same physics of um, the Earth, the terrestrial physics. Um, and again, the consequence of this is that a planet moves faster near the sun. And in terms of angular momentum, this again should kind of make sense to you because is r is getting smaller, v perp has to get faster in order to conserve momentum. And as r gets bigger, v perp has to drop in order to conserve angular momentum. And so that relationship that we were just talking about with an elliptical orbit, that when the planet is closer to the sun, it will uh, move with a faster uh, speed. And when it's further, it'll move with a slower speed. That whole thing really connects to this idea of conservation of angular momentum. Um, at the closest and furthest approach, these are some very nice special cases because at the point of uh, furthest approach um, and, and closest approach, remember the sun is at one of the focal points. So the closest approach is um, when you are at, um, along the semi-major axis, but on the side of the semi-major axis that's closest to the focal point, and the furthest approach is over here. Um, uh, and so this is R max and R min. These special cases are nice because the speed is um, uh, R per, uh, V perp is just equal to V here because the, the tangent is perpendicular to the radius at these two points. So what we can do is at these two extreme points, we can say that the angular momentum is equal, the magnitude of the angular momentum is equal to the, um, the magnitude of R cross P which is equal to mrv sine theta, uh, which is a constant. Now this principle is true no matter where we are along the ellipse, but the special case at these two points is that sine theta is one. In other words, we can use uh, mrv. The closest point of approach to the sun is what's known as the perihelion, um, rp, uh, the perigree for orbiting around the earth. The furthest distance from the sun, ra, is the aphelion, um, apogee for orbiting around the earth. So those are the two terms. If, if it's an object orbiting the Earth, we call it the perigee and the apogee. If it's the Earth or any planet orbiting the Sun, we call it perihelion and aphelion. Um, and Rp is equal to A times 1 minus the eccentricity. 
and our A is equal to A times 1 plus the eccentricity. We have that uh, A equals 1 half RA plus RP, um, and the eccentricity equals RA minus RP over RA plus RP, um, and again, we can see that that gives us a situation where if RA equals RP, it's the circular case and eccentricity is zero. Um, and as uh, the thing becomes more and more elliptical, the distance between RA and RP gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, converging towards the case where um, this equal is, is, is approaching one. Kepler's third law states that the period of an orbit is proportional to a to the three halves power. Um, in other words, uh, t equals two pi a to the three halves over the square root of gm, to be more precise. There's a constant, that's the proportionality constant, is two pi over the square root of gm. Um, and a here, of course, again, is the semi-major axis. Uh, this is easy to prove for a circular orbit. If you set a equal to r, you end up getting that the period is equal to two pi r over v circ. Um, um, for example, r mars is equal uh, to two times uh, 2.28 times 10 to the 11th meters. Our Earth is 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters from the sun. And if we want to know the difference between the periods, we can just take uh, r mars over r Earth to the three halves power, and we end up getting that uh, it's equal to 1.87. Uh, a Martian year is pretty close to twice an Earth year. There's a concept known as a geosynchronous orbit. This is the case where we are orbiting the Earth uh, at the same angular speed that the Earth is rotating about its axis so that our satellite remains located above the same point on the Earth um, all the time. Um, so if uh, there is a geosynchronous orbit directly above you, it will remain directly above you day and night. As the Earth is rotating about its axis towards night, the object is orbiting um, at the same angular speed so that it's always directly above you. So basically, we take Kepler's formula for the period, 2 pi r to the 3 halves over the square root of gm. I'll, I'll point out, of course, that Kepler's formula did not have uh, the, the precise uh, formulation of the constant here because this presumes uh, Newton's law. Um, he, Kepler didn't have Newton's constant. But uh, anyway, we take this formula for the period and we solve for it in terms of the, or we solve for the radius. So we get this formula. And now we set this formula equal to the period of the Earth's rotation, which is 86,400 seconds. Um, and then we solve for the radius. So we plug in the uh, period for the rotation of the Earth about its axis into this formula, and this is the radius, 4.2 times 10 to the 7th miles, or 26,300 miles from the center of the Earth. Now, uh, to give you guys kind of a sense of scale here, um, the space station, as I pointed out, I believe is around, I don't know, a little more than 500, maybe about 600 miles above the, the surface of the Earth. Um, uh, the geosynchronous orbit is quite a bit higher, 22,000 miles from the surface of the Earth. And so getting things in geosynchronous orbit takes a lot more energy and is a lot harder, and, and there's a whole, whole business about that. But of course, uh, GPS um, really relies on that, so there's an industry of getting satellites to geosynchronous orbit. A little bit more on elliptical orbits. Um, again, one of the things that's nice about elliptical orbits is that we can evoke conservation of momentum, and that means that uh, at any point along the ellipse, MRV sine theta needs to be constant, and that means that if you calculate it at one point, you know it at all points. Um, again, at the point of nearest and furthest distance, R1 V1 equals R2 V2, um, and that sine theta uh, you don't need to worry about. Um, because uh, the tangential velocity is perpendicular to the radius, and so sine theta is 1. Conservation of energy tells us that this 1 half mv squared minus gmm over r is going to be the same no matter what we are, where we are on the orbit. So at one point on the orbit, v1 squared minus gm over r1 is equal to, at another point in the orbit, v2 squared minus gm over r2. So if if I know details about one point in the orbit, 
um, I can move to another point in the orbit and I know that at another point in the orbit the energy is the same and the angular momentum is the same. So given any two of these variables, r1 and v1, r2 and v2, uh, any combination of those two, um, you can find the other two provided that uh, they are at the nearest and furthest points. So if I give you uh, the r1 at the nearest point and the v2 at the furthest point, uh, you have enough to derive the speeds and radii at all of the other points and similarly for any other combination. Uh, let's do an example. The comet Tuttle giacobini Cresac, uh, which, which passed by in 2017. It was visible with binoculars on April 1st, 2017. Uh, and these are the minimum and maximum distances from the sun. So the minimum distance was 1.572 times 10 to the 11th meters. And the furthest distance of this uh, comet is R2 equals 7.683 times 10 to the 11th meters. Here we're going to bring both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum to bear on this problem. We start with conservation of energy. We know that the energy at the point of nearest approach is equal to the energy at the point of furthest approach. Now, if we want to solve for the velocity um, at uh, V2, we can solve for this in terms of V1 because of conservation of angular momentum. We, we know that um, RV1 equals RV2 and therefore V2 equals RV1 divided by R2. So we're just substituting that in for V2, and we square it because it's V2 squared. We plug it in here. And so we have that V1 squared minus 2GM over R1 is equal to R1 V1 over R2 squared minus 2GM over R2. And now we can do some simplifying algebra, and we get that uh, v1 squared times r2 squared minus r1 squared over r2 squared uh, is equal to 2gm over r1 r2 times r2 minus r1. If we solve for v1, we get this formula that 2gm r2 over r1 plus r2 times r1, um, square root of that, we get 3.75 times 10 to the fourth meters per second for V1, and then V2, we can just multiply by the ratio of the radii, and we get that it's 7.67 times 10 to the third meters per second. And, you know, as a sanity check, it's going much faster at the point of closest approach than it is at the point of furthest approach. Also, we can derive that uh, A is equal to 4.627 times 10 to the 11th meters. And therefore, once we know A, <laughs> we can calculate that the period is 1.71 times 10 to the 8th seconds, or 5.4 years. So far, we've assumed small mass objects in orbit around much larger mass objects, where lowercase m is much smaller than capital M. And in that case, we can approximate the larger mass as being at rest. In other words, in all of our problems so far, we're kind of just treating the sun <laughs> as if it's stationary and the, uh, the planets are orbiting around it. In truth, all of the planets and the sun are orbiting around a shared center of mass. And this is that same phenomenon we've talked about again and again, where you have a Newtonian pair of one thing is pulling on the other and the other is pulling on the one. And they're pulling in equal and opposite directions, but if the one object is much, much more massive, it moves a lot less. Um, both objects, all of the objects, um, are following uh, elliptical paths around the center of mass of the system. But if you posit a situation where you have two equal masses that are orbiting, they're both going to be orbiting a shared center of mass that is outside of both of those objects. And an example of this would be a binary star. Um, if we want to be accurate in the case of unequal masses, it's not that the mass in the center is completely stationary. Rather, it's kind of wobbling around the shared center of mass between it and the smaller object. Um, and we drew, uh, on the left case, equal masses in the limit of a perfectly circular orbit, but we can also have the elliptical case of two objects with ellipses that share a uh, common uh, focal point. Um, so an example where you'll see this kind of motion is where you have really large planets orbiting a star 
um, or binary systems where you have two stars that are orbiting each other. So there are cases where the, uh, the, the masses of the objects that are orbiting are comparable enough that you can't make this assumption of small m uh, being much smaller than capital M. One parenthetical about measuring the radius of the Earth, you know, as we know, the Earth is spherical, or most people know that. Um, it's worth pointing out that this has been known since at least 200 BC. Um, and Eratosthenes of Cyrene was the first one to measure this, at least that we have on record, and his measurement was, was quite impressive. He basically uh, did the whole calculation uh, using trigonometry and um, uh, shadows. So he had a vertical stick at noon on the summer solstice in Syene, uh, which is at a latitude of 24 degrees, and at Alexandria. And the sun is coming in, and the beams of light are parallel. And at Syene, there was no shadow, because uh, his pole is parallel to the sun. But at Alexandria, which is at a different latitude, uh, the relative angle of the pole compared to the incoming sunlight uh, did have an offset. and so there was a shadow, and based on the size of that shadow, he could calculate theta as being roughly the length of the shadow over the length of the stick. And um, he also knows that uh, from, from uh, in geometry, parallel lines, that this theta here is equal to this theta, the theta between the two points, and that's the distance between Alexandria and Syene divided by the radius of the Earth, and from that he got the radius of the Earth to be around 7,000 kilometers, uh, which was 10% larger than the actual value, but pretty darn good for a measurement using shadows uh, in ancient Greece. So, um, cool stuff. Uh, one last thing I'll just say on these lectures is that there are some really cool orbit simulators that you can play around with on um, uh, uh, colorado.edu. Uh, I have the link above here. Um, and there's 11 preset scenarios, but you can also adjust the parameters and see what orbits look like. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that we've been approximating orbits as being between two objects, but it's much more complicated in our solar system. There are many bodies. And uh, when you have all of those objects interacting, you can get chaotic or unpredictable behavior. And uh, some of the foundations of what's known as chaos theory um, uh, came from uh, studying the behavior of what's called many-body uh, orbital mechanics. Um, so it's, it's really fun to play around with, and I, I recommend it. But with that, I will end here.